Hello everybody, welcome to this introduction of Christina Rossetti's Maud Clare. So Maud Clare's from 1857, published in the Goblin Market and Other Poems collection, um, as was the last poem we looked at. Um, without further ado, I'll read it for you uh, and then we'll get into having a look at some analysis. Maud Clare by Christina Rossetti. Out of the church she followed them with a lofty step and mien. His bride was like a village maid, Maud Clare was like a queen. Son Thomas, his lady mother said with smiles, almost with tears, may Nell and you but live as true as we have done for years. Your father thirty years ago had just your tale to tell, but he was not so pale as you, nor I so pale as now. My lord was pale with inward strife, and Nell was pale with pride. My lord gazed long on pale more declare, or ever he kissed the bride. Lo, I have brought my gift, my lord, have brought my gift, she said, to bless the hearth, to bless the board, to bless the marriage bed. Here's my half of the golden chain you wore about your neck. That day we waded ankle deep for lilies in the beck. Here's my half of the faded leaves we plucked from the budding bough. With feet among the lily leaves, the lilies are budding now. He strove to match her scorn with scorn. He faltered in his place. Lady, he said, Maud Clare, he said, Maud Clare, and hid his face. She turned to Nell. My lady Nell, I have a gift for you, though were it fruit, the blooms were gone, or were it flowers, the dew. Take my share of a fickle heart, mine of a paltry love. Take it or leave it as you will. I wash my hands thereof. And what you leave, said Nell, I'll take, and what you spurn, I'll wear, for he's my lord, for better or worse, and him I love, Maud Clare. Yea, though you're taller by the head, more wise and much more fair, I'll love him till he loves me best, me best of all, Maud Clare. So immediately the regularity of those um, 12 quatrains, is it 12? I think so. Uh, the 12 quatrains and the rhyme scheme and the meter, it all shouts ballad. It, it, it is a very, very traditional sounding ballad form. Now, as we know, ballads were sometimes used to tell stories and this in true to form is a narrative poem. Um, they were used to tell stories that would be remembered in an oral tradition, which is why the ballad form is so regular and that rhyme is such a useful aid memoir. The, the other thing about ballads in this period were, was that they were quite often used to, to have a kind of moral fable element to them. Um, and so we're looking for, as soon as we realise that we're in that kind of form, we're looking to see whether we can see kind of, some kind of moral comment. Uh, from Rossetti. Um, we have a speaker who is a kind of observer figure uh, and the speaker actually ha in includes the first person at, at some one or two points directly. Uh, we've also got a cast of characters um, and if we take it from the top uh, let's let's see if we can work out who's who and what's what. So the first stanza follows Maud Clare and notices that she follows the married couple as they leave the church. Rather than starting with the married couple, the focus of the start of the poem is on Maud Clare, emphasised of course by the title of the poem. This is a poem as much about her um, as it is about anybody else. She's described as having a lofty step and a mean. Uh, this word mean um, is shares a root with the word demeanour. Um, which means the way somebody looks, it, it, that communicates something of their character. So so-and-so's demeanour suggested they were like this or like that. She's got a lofty step. She's high. Lofty means high. Uh, a lofty step and mean. And then we've got juxtaposition with the bride, whose name is Nell. 
Both monosyllabic, these names, Nell and Maud. It needs to be said that the, the name Maud was very popular in the Victorian period. Um, it was especially popularised by Tennyson, who we've come across one or two times as being a bit of a monolithic influence in the background behind Christina Rossetti. And his poem, entitled Maud, um, was a very well-known poem. It was, in fact, Tennyson's own favourite. Um, and that the name Maud means someone who back... Now, this is a kind of fairly traditional response to the wedding from the from the parents of the bride or the groom um, with smiles almost with tears we're going to also come back to those tears and make a call on whether or not they are tears of pure joy or whether there is some regret or loss in those tears hopefully we'll, i'll remember to come back to that and then she gives a kind of blessing. She says, may Nell and you but live as true as we have done for years. Now we infer from that we that that's the parents, that's the parents of Thomas, that's the speaker, the mother and her husband, um, as we have done for years. And I'm going to underline the word true because true here means faithful. It doesn't mean happy, um, which might be significant. And the mother continues with her bit of exposition. Your father 30 years ago had just your tale to tell, but he was not so pale as you, nor I so pale as now. So what's this tale that the mother is suggesting happened to Thomas's father, just as it's now happening to him? Is it just the getting married uh, and the nerves, the kind of um, the, the pale faced nerves of the, of the wedding day? Or is it something to do with the fact that Maud Clare has turned up and maybe she's the reason that Thomas is so pale. Now we haven't fully discovered yet who Maud Clare is but we, uh, we're starting to read between the lines. But he was not so pale as you nor I so pale as now. My Lord was pale with inward strife. It's slightly confusing here. This my Lord is the, is, the, is the first person narrative perspective. My Lord is, is a way of saying he in some ways. So my Lord was pale with inward strife. This is the narrative perspective describing Thomas. My Lord was pale with inward strife and Nell was pale with pride. Again, there's juxtaposition between the reasons for their pale appearance. Nell happily is pale with pride. She's, had, she's having a wonderful day. She's delighted to be getting married to Thomas. Thomas, however, is pale with inward strife. So we immediately make the link between the strife and this character of Maud Clare. And then we have a bit more explanation. My Lord gazed long on pale Maud Clare, or ever he kissed the bride. I think or ever is a bit of an archaic way of saying before ever, before he ever kissed the bride. So before he ever kissed the bride, he spent his time gazing at Maud Clare. Now gazing is probably a kind of Victorian euphemism here for the fact that Thomas has had a relationship with Maud Clare before his wedding. Okay, so let's just question mark this gazed here because that's, I think, slightly euphemistic. Um, we've got pale Maud Clare as well. Pale here might mean beautiful, um, but all three of the protagonists are pale for perhaps three different reasons. And then Maud Clare gets her entry uh, into the into the poem and she brings ostensibly blessings. Now the blessings are emphasized by the kind of triad form of what she offers. She offers uh, a blessing for the hearth, to bless the board, to bless the marriage bed. Um, you'll notice that this list, let me get the spelling right, I wrote this down so I could definitely spell it correctly. This list includes um, all the connectives to do this, to do this, to do this. It's not the first of these syndetic lists that we get. Syndetic just means a list that includes the connectives. The connectives are not replaced by commas. You think about um, writers like Roald Dahl describing the sweet shop. He'd, he'd say there were gumdrops and bonbons and sherbet dips and lollipops. And that deliberate leaving in of the connectives creates an effect. It can create an emphasis on the number of things being described or the wonderful nature of the things being described. It's a deliberate choice uh, that Rossetti chooses to include the connectives um, in that syndetic list. Three things she blesses. The hearth, which is the fireplace, which represents the home. Um, the board, 
uh, which is the table, which represents the kind of day-to-day -day life or the, the sustenance of the, of the house, the day-to-day the -day life of the house, and the marriage bed, which is the, the relationship. So she's really kind of getting herself um, inveigled or involved in the three kind of pillars of married life, certainly in Victorian times, those three pillars of, of, of almost sacred marriage, married life, and Maud Clare is blessing them. Um, it's a little bit like that moment in fairy tale christenings when the the kind of unwilling or uninvited guest turns up and and gives a kind of blessing slash curse i'm thinking sleeping beauty but i'm sure there's probably lots of others um the repetitive nature of some of these some of what she's saying here sounds slightly incantatory a little bit like a um a witch delivering a spell although we are supposed to look up to Maud Clare. So there's a bit of a, a bit of a tension there. Here's my half of the golden chain you wore about your neck. Okay, what a nightmare. She's turned up at the wedding to return romantic gifts that Thomas gave her when they were together. Uh, this is obviously deeply, uh, imagine it, just put yourself in these shoes. It's, 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 a, it's a traumatic experience. So he'd given her a chain. They had half of the chain each. She's brought the chain back and she's remembered the day or she reminds the, the company of the day when he gave it to them, uh, to her. That day we waded ankle deep for lilies in the beck. So that she's detailing the kind of sort of lovely freedom, the natural pastoral bliss of their relationship. Perhaps symbolic are these lilies. Um, we know the pre-Raphaelites enjoyed the symbolism of flowers, uh, Victorians actually in, in general enjoyed the symbolism of flowers and lilies if you look them up are, are often associated with weddings um, but they're also also associated with virginity um, so her mentioning of you know wading ankle deep for lilies is probably um, an, a euphemistic or a symbolic suggestion that she and Thomas were involved in a sexual relationship which for the Victorian man was permitted a sexual relationship before marriage. Um, we'll come back to that idea. Here's my half of the faded leaves, she goes on to say, we plucked from the budding bough. With feet among the lily leaves, the lilies are budding now. Loads of mentioning of lilies. It's like we really are supposed to notice that these flowers are specifically li lilies. And we've got some um, alliteration with the B sounds of budding or the repetition of budding. Um, the budding bough is there's the alliteration um, and the link in that repetition between the two buddings. From the budding bow, the lilies are budding now. Budding suggests um, fertility. It suggests the fact that perhaps the fact that the lilies are budding now means that the, the relationship between Maud Clare and Thomas was ended prematurely. The lilies didn't, hadn't a chance to bud. Um, and then this embarrassing stanza where Thomas tries to kind of talk his way out of it and fails miserably. He strove to match her scorn with scorn. Now, when I read this um, at first, I, I wasn't sure that I really detected a note of scorn um, in Maud Clare's stanzas, the, the ones in which she speaks. So I, I read back over them looking for some note of scorn, the, the scorn that um, the narrator or the, the, the narrative perspective it highlights here. Um, and I think it's really, if there's scorn, it's really implied. It's the scorn that she's turned up to deliver these gifts in person at the time that she has, rather than any kind of edge to what she says, although you might disagree and see that and see some edge in what she's saying. But in either case, Thomas attempts to match Maud Clare, um, scorn with scorn. Um, but faltered. So faltered means kind of stumbled. He's, he's, he faltered in his place. Lady, he said, Maud Clare, he's not going well, is it? All the Cesaurus is not going well. He's, he's tripping over his words. Maud Clare, he says, Maud Clare, and hid his face. This is not repetition for emphasis. This is repetition, obviously, for kind of trepidation, embarrassment. He's tongue tied. He, he's ashamed. He doesn't know what to say. And the Cesaurus kind of make that quite naturalistic. Um, the naturalistic pauses or stumbles.
Now, the idea of this being naturalistic is interesting. Is an interesting idea because the the ballad form, as I said at the beginning, is a is quite a strictly regulated form. Um, it's designed for a kind of repetitive oral tradition, so it's designed to be mem memorable with the regularity of the stanzas and the rhyme scheme and the rhythm. Um, and yet, here's Rossetti putting in kind of naturalistic elements, and it's not the only one that she does. Um, if you look at the rhyme scheme of um, the poem, we've got an A, B, uh, C, B rhyme scheme. Should have done it this side, shouldn't I? A, B, C, B rhyme scheme, which was quite unusual for the ballad form. The ballad form, to make it really easy to remember, would have been A, B, A, B. So Rossetti's introduced a, a, a line three in a four line quatrain that doesn't rhyme with line one, which perhaps r removes a bit of the artifice of that rhyme scheme and creates a little bit more of a, a light, natural uh, flavor. Um, whilst we're talking about structural choices, maybe we should talk about the, the rhythm as well. Out of the church, she followed them with a lofty step and mean. His bride was like a village maid. Maud Clare was like a queen. His, his bride was like a village maid. We've got a mixture alternating um, trimeter and tetrameter. So that's quite a classic ballad rhythm as well. Okay, let's get back to where we were. So poor Thomas is uh, failing miserably to stand up for himself here. Um, and now Maud Clare, having given him a moment to embarrass himself, now turns to Nell. She speaks to her politely. Um, this is not, she's not come to make a scene. Um, she's certainly sort of polite, my lady Nell. I have a gift for you. And we kind of hold our breath, what's it going to be? Um, Rossetti makes us wait to see what it is with this kind of um, subordinate thought. Though, where it fruit, the blooms were gone, or where it flowers, the dew. We've, uh, we've noticed that Rossetti before talking about flowers being kind of enhanced with dew. Um, she's saying, if, if, if my gift were flowers, there's no dew on it. There's no dew on them. The dew's gone. Um, if, uh, if it was fruits, there's no blooms on the fruit. This is a kind of tarnished gift or a, a kind of lacking gift that I'm giving you, she says. What's it going to be? Of course, the gift, the gift is, is Thomas. So Maud Clare is giving the gift of the bridegroom to Nell, which suggests that, of course, he was hers before he was Nell's. So it's in Maud Clare's gift to say to Nell, it's okay, you can have him. Um, take my share of a fickle heart. Now fickle here, uh, as often, is, uh, is, a, is a criticism. Fickle is something or somebody that is changeable. We had um, ideas and words for changeable in the last poem we looked at. Um, this is Maud Clare suggesting that Thomas is fickle. And if somebody's fickle, particularly in a romantic sense, it means that their heart is changeable, that he's fallen out of love um, with somebody and fallen into, into love with somebody else. Um, it's a criticism of Thomas. So we've not got a great sense of Thomas. He's not. It's not terribly impressive. This real juxtaposes with the um, the Round Tower poem that we looked at, where the husband is a much more kind of is much more of a source of strength in, in that marriage. Uh, this 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 Thomas is a is quite the opposite. Um, fickle heart. Take my share of a paltry love. Paltry, inadequate, small, weak, mean. Take it or leave it as you will. I wash my hands thereof. So this is Maud Clare doing this. He's all yours. And he's not that great. So into this moment of awfulness, Nell then steps in. And to give her credit, Grisetti gives her a real sense of calm strength here. Um, and what you leave, said Nell, I'll take, and what you spurn, I'll wear, for he's my lord, for better or worse, and I love him, Maud Clare. We've got the repeated ands here. So this is um, another example of a syndetic list. 
and it echoes Maud Clare's earlier on, almost like Nell is is matching like for like. I, you know, I'm 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 equal to you in the sense that I can also I can also use this rhetorical device and and make my point strongly. Um, she obviously echoes the marriage service. The Christian marriage service has that promise that you will stick with your husband or wife for better or worse. So she she echoes that marriage service, which reminds the listener of where they've just come from. Um, what you spurn, I'll wear. Spurn here means reject. Um, I'll wear. And him I love, Maud Claire. Um, yea, though you're taller by the head, more wise and much more fair. So this is now comparing herself with Maud Claire and comparing herself le less favourably. Maud Claire is lofty and superior to her according to Nell as well. In some ways, perhaps, um, she would have been, on the face of it, uh, perhaps a better match for Thomas. We don't know. We'll come back to that idea. But I'll love him till he loves me best, me best of all, Maud Claire. Now, one wonders then why perhaps if Thomas doesn't love Nell the best, why he's marrying Nell at all. And remember the pale face of uh, Thomas in that inward strife that he's feeling at the appearance of Maud Clare. He's not over that relationship, it would seem. Um, and Nell is under no illusion about the nature of that relationship and of the nature of Thomas's feelings. So why has Thomas married Nell and not Maud Clare? Why has Thomas abandoned Maud Clare for Nell? That abandonment aspect is implied in the the budding lilies which are budding after he's abandoned her the the scorn the implied scorn of turning up at that point to return the gifts so the question is why and i think and um critics that you read will agree that this is a comment on marriage victorian marriage from rossetti Nell is a maid. We underline that word in stanza one. Nell is a maid. Maid means virgin. And here Christina Rossetti appears to be shining on a light on what was a very centrally accepted hypocrisy um, in the marriage agreement, um, certainly through up until the Victorian period and, and in many parts of the world, uh, to this day, the idea that a woman is expected to be in some way chaste or pure, um, whereas it doesn't really matter what the man's been doing. Um, this would seem to be a deliberate comment from Rossetti about the institution of marriage, which was a hugely central part of Victor the, the way that Victorian society was morally organised. The, the, the marriage was this sacrosanct institution upon which a whole system of kind of moral certainties were were based um, so a gently subversive tone to the poem Maud Clare is the wronged woman and she's turned up with some self-respect um, on the wedding day this isn't a kind of rolling around in the mud Jerry Springer awfulness. This isn't an embarrassing scene in that regard. And in fact, everyone holds on to their dignity pretty well, perhaps except for Thomas. Why is that? What's Christina Rossetti saying about those accepted um, social uh, structures? Now, we know that the poem's written after Rossetti's religious devotion had really taken hold this is this is published during the period that she's um, deeply involved with her faith although obviously apart from the marriage vows and the, the setting of, of the poem this is not a devotional poem um, and she gives us these three kind of stock characters the woman scorned she gives us the ideal bride in the shape of Nell um, we give her, we, we have a husband and we have the mother she seems to be asking us to judge who the better match would be. She therefore seems to be asking us to judge whether it's fair um, that men and women are expected to behave so differently um, as they approach marriage, which is interesting. Interesting, not least because of Rossetti's own 
experience of romantic love. Um, she certainly didn't expe experience marriage, although she was, as we know, um, engaged um, and proposed to it at least sort of two times, if not three times. Um, some some contextual examination, um, I think, would be rewarding for this poem, looking at what, what's Rossetti saying. She seems to be holding something back in terms of directly attacking that institution and the hypocrisy of it. Um, we know that Rossetti's own feminism was was would should go as far as to point out inequality without going so far as to adopt suffrage or, or to, to, to take on the fight to create equality. She's certainly of her time as well as someone who felt that there were inequalities that women got the worst of. Um, so lots of contextual suggestions in this poem, I think, that would, would reward some reading. Okay, so to summarise, we've got a ballad form lightened by the non-traditional uh, rhyme scheme, but to all intents and purposes, the ballad, the regularity of the, of the metre, for instance, We've got the, these characters, we've got dialogue, uh, we've got a implied suggestion that all is not fair within this most Victorian institution, the institution of Christian marriage. Um, yeah, interesting. An another perspective of, of Christina Rossetti's um, attitudes towards the roles of men and women um, and the place of women in her society. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. All the best.